So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Ada Weiss, I'm from Peer5. Uh, one of the co-founders co of Peer5, and Peer5 is a new type of content delivery network that is based on users, um, and also it is web-based, so we're gonna touch a lot of JavaScript and WebRTC stuff. Uh, who's familiar with WebRTC? Just everybody. Okay, so we can skip that part uh, pretty fast. Uh, yeah, so WebRTC is an API definition. It's not necessarily code or implementation. Uh, Google and, Pro and Mozilla implemented it at the beginning, um, uh, but it's formally it's an API uh, for real-time communications. Uh, and now it is already uh, baked in into the modern, bro modern browsers. Uh, we have Chrome, Firefox, and Opera. Uh, luckily, IE is also um, getting there with ORTC. Uh, surprisingly, they did some really nice work, and they are working together with, all, with the rest of the browser vendors. Um, so it, it looks optimistic uh, at the moment. Uh, WebRTC is an interesting open source project because uh, first of all, it is open source under uh, the BSD license, uh, and browser vendors uh, all work on it together and uh, take it as it is and implement it in the, in the browser. Uh, but also, I, I, I'm not sure if there are any other projects that uh, cost that much, uh, because Google spent almost $200 million on companies that they acquired back in 2010 uh, in order to uh, get high quality codecs, uh, which they just open sourced everything. It was uh, audio codecs, uh, ILBC and ISAC, and also uh, VP8, uh, which is, uh, uh, is part of WebM. Um, quite recently, Cisco opened H.264, which is now also mandatory in uh, WebRTC. Uh, so in that terms, I think it's uh, an interesting open source project. Uh, but we're not going to talk about these codecs. We're going to talk about Data Channels API, which is uh, the little brother of the main API. The main API talks about audiovisual uh, capabilities, like uh, building a Hangout application so we can talk one-to-one -one, um, using uh, uh, audio and video. The other part of the API uh, is called Data, Data Channels API or Data API um, and simply lets you, let you transfer any arbitrary data between two endpoints, peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and it's a full network stack, okay? So uh, every browser up until recently had a stack that is based on TCP and now we have a really rich stack that is based on UDP. It's pretty exciting. Uh, it's UDP as a transport layer, and then I stun and turn um, to, to do the NAT traversal. Um, and on top of it, uh, we have SCTP uh, and DTLS for, uh, for the secure layer. Uh, and on top of everything, the data channel uh, protocol itself, um, and, and, and as end users, as uh, developers, we use Data Channel uh, API directly, uh, but there are a lot of stuff going under, a lot of stuff going on under the hood uh, that WebRTC uh, is doing, and I'm not going to go too deep on that. Um, I want to say why we think it's huge, because so we have another full stack that lets us build wonderful things, uh, and especially it can fix this. I mean, the web was supposed to be very decentralized. From the beginning, everybody wanted it to be decentralized, that no component would be too crucial, too important. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, things are too centralized today. Uh, everything is uh, dependent on web servers. Um, even if we want to build simple chat applications, uh, that just communicate between one endpoint to another endpoint. We need a server to do that. Uh, we need WebSockets or HTTP. 
and that's kind of a, a limitation that we have today um, and and it caused it caused us as developers to build a lot of logic into into the server side and it's not really necessary and and it's actually uh, harming the performance and the architecture as a whole. Uh, WebRTC will hopefully solve this and, and make the web fully distributed and, and we'll see more functionality going into the endpoints, into the client side. And how does it work? So you know WebRTC, I, I'll go quickly on, um, on this one. So. Uh, it's not as easy as a client-server communication where you just open a connection to a server. And two random uh, computers in the internet cannot just communicate <laughs> without a third party to, uh, uh, to, to help them with the discovery and opening up the firewalls and the NATs. Um, so just quickly, uh, a WebRTC sessions uh, begin with uh, signaling from the uh, initiator to the to server in a signaling channel. Um, many people use WebSockets and Node.js here. Very easy to implement. Uh, once the metadata is uh, transferred between the two endpoints and they actually uh, want to start the, uh, the direct channel between them, they need uh, to do the NAT reversal, which is done in ICE. Uh, either using turn servers, uh, which are basically a relay, uh, or using stun, and that's what we're trying to achieve most of the time. Um, the stun opens up the firewalls and the two browsers can communicate uh, directly. What can we do with it? Um, so this is the trivial uh, use cases, send files, send metadata in games, or other things, uh, text. But we're talking about media today. Um, and for media, probably need a mesh network, which is uh, a network with more than one, uh, more than two uh, uh, nodes. Um, we like to think about three types of mesh networks. The full mesh, where everybody are connected to everybody. And the overlay tree and the, uh, the partial mesh network, a dynamic mesh network. Uh, in practice, people use the right one. Um, and the use cases for this uh, are varied. Uh, it can be games. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you heard about Cube Slam or the games Mozilla built. Uh, in video, new companies are. are um, building really interesting applications today like Talkbox or Room and BEM TV is an interesting live peer-to-peer -peer solution um, audio solutions, file sharing, we have a, a project named ShareFest and it's also built with these mesh networks um, okay. um, but usually it's not enough um, usually you want to complement this mesh network uh, with a server. Uh, we're, we're not against servers, although we said we believe uh, the web should be more decentralized. It, it doesn't mean that servers are now uh, obsolete, obviously. Um, and the two technologies can really work together well. Uh, if you think about it, peer-to-peer -peer normally needs servers for the beginning. Uh, before the content gets popular um, uh, and for sourcing the content. Um, on the other end, servers are, uh, are hard to scale. Um, are, they are expensive, uh, they, they have errors, they can break, and uh, it's, it's harder to replace them with something else, with more servers. Um, so the mixture between these two uh, kind of bring something new to the table with uh, infinite scale. It is more resilient to problems. It is faster and lower latency. <laughs> now, as a user of, um, uh, of this network, I can get <laughs> content from closer sources. Uh, the, the, del the, the latency uh, compared to the server is lower. Um, and it's cheaper. It's cost effective to build something that is based on, on us, the users, uh, compared to 
pouring more and more resources on the server side. So uh, how can we build a WebRTC CDN? Um, there's uh, a little, uh, uh, there, there, there are two meanings here. Uh, WebRTC CDN can mean also a CDN that supports WebRTC. That's not what we're trying to do. Trying to build a layer on top of the servers that caches content in this mesh network and can build a, a, a high throughput uh, delivery network. Um, and th that's what we do in Peer 5, and, and it needs to be easy to use. Uh, so if I'm already using a CDN or I'm already using a, a few data centers, it needs to be easy to add another layer of, of cache. Um, it needs to be agnostic to all sorts of web servers and, 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 and all sorts of HTTP impl uh, implementations. Um, tricky part also is to work in different use cases. Um, it needs to be secured so no malicious peer can get in the middle and send me some content that I don't want to get. Obviously, it needs to be fast and, and scalable, so uh, it would be helpful to use it. And uh, open source here helps a lot because some of the problems are solved uh, by other people. <laughs> uh, for instance, security. Um, if you build something in JavaScript, uh, you run under many, many layers of, of, uh, of software that um, limits you in a way, uh, which is sometimes more difficult. But in a way, it makes sense because uh, it, it, it makes easier to secure these kinds of applications and Google and, Google and Mozilla spend a lot of time to make sure everything is encrypted and works very, very secured. Uh, so we, we don't need to re-implement it and reinvent the wheel as opposed to uh, uh, previous peer-to-peer uh, -peer solutions uh, that were in the market that had to implement everything, all the encryption layers, all the data layers. Uh, we, s we, I mean, we can't break too much. We can't do uh, too much harm. Uh, so we use a lot of open source uh, projects, and uh, I'll, I'll go over the, the architecture of, of of our solution. So uh, the origin HTTP media server can be any HTTP server. It can be a CDN, whatever. That's the existing um, uh, components. Uh, and we add uh, the, the complementary peer-to-peer components. So uh, on the back end, uh, in red, it's our tracker. Uh, it's a signaling layer. It's a, a not traversal layer. And it's also uh, um, simply a CDN that serves our uh, JavaScript. So we can actually do what we're doing. Um, so when the Peer 5 JS is loaded from uh, uh, from our CDN through a browser, it connects to the backend using WebSocket, and it then it will get matches to other peers that can contribute to the content delivery. Uh, from there, <coughs> the peer can connect to multiple uh, uh, peers, and it will begin. Um, uh, uh, a connection session with other peers using uh, the standard WebRTC process, which includes signaling and not traversal and whatever is necessary for the two peers to communicate. Once they are connected, um, they can exchange metadata and data uh, uh, independently, uh, which is very efficient. It's very low latency. It, uh, it works well, and the server uh, and the tracker is not uh, uh, worried about that. Um, so I try to show a demo. Let's see what happens. Uh, no. Not have internet. Mm. 
Okay, okay let me just <laughs> just show you something small. Did you get the Wi-Fi? Which Wi-Fi? That's okay. Uh, I'll skip the the full demo. So I don't know why this frame was picked. Interesting uh, screenshot. <laughs> but it was the demo I just ran, and it's this represents the actual uh, chunks that I received as a peer, and I actually construct construct the buffer uh, on the fly from the various sources. Uh, it's not real time streaming; it's a buffer that is constructed from uh, uh, like pseudo streaming uh, construction where chunks are received and uh, it can be from multiple uh, uh, sources and if uh, one source suddenly disappears it's okay we will get a chunk from a different source um, let's continue Okay, but this is our problem today. Uh, maybe someone else has the same problem. Uh, most of um, the video applications today are working in a way that uh, the, the native player, the video tag, whatever, um, is connected to a media server in a way that we can't break the connection. Uh, like video, um, Video tag with SRC uh, X dot MP4 will mean that means that uh, the video tag will just fetch content uh, from that resource, and nobody can touch it, nobody can intercept it, and it means that just one server uh, will be re responsible for the delivery of this uh, of this file, and we don't want that. And we want uh, full control. We want um, multiple sources. We want to have prioritization and other features uh, that will make the, the delivery more efficient. Uh, so we, be we believe that the world needs to shift from uh, a native playback, a native delivery, uh, to something that is more JavaScript-based, apl ap application-based delivery, where we have more control as developers. Uh, luckily, it's, it's already happening with media source API uh, and Dash. So uh, um, the model of native HTTP agent that fetches content from the media server is, is, change, uh, is changing from, um, uh, from that to something that is based on a video player that has some JavaScript logic that uh, fetches content through uh, XHR, through XMH request, and then pushes it to the, um, to the player. It's much better uh, because it lets us also build um, more mechanisms in the client side, build more distributed smart applications. Uh, we can build uh, better analytics in the client side. Uh, we can prioritize between the video chunks. We can control the bandwidth. We can have multiple slots, multiple connection, uh, connections even to a, a single server. Uh, or we can use several servers at the same time. Uh, we can do smart prefetching and all sorts of uh, uh, interesting JavaScript logic very easily. Um, instead of just fetching content using uh, XHR, we can use WebRTC. Uh, we can do uh, offline storage. We can uh, you can use Pure Five. Um, and th the end result is that it's a more distributed approach. Uh, uh, which is we think it's, it's, it's smarter. Uh, there are a few enablers to make this happen. Media source extensions, obviously. Uh, Dash with J Dash JS, and I, I was happy to hear the guys from uh, all the players that uh, are actually implementing it, and it's very important for them. Uh, MP4 box from GPAC also helps a lot because you can take a, a progressive MP4 and on the fly change it 
um, to something that media source extension can actually play. Uh, if you want to use Flash, if you want to use HLS, uh, then you have two choices, either with Flash, uh, and then you need something like Flash LS, uh, players like Clapper or VideoJS that already uh, bridges between Flash and JavaScript, uh, and we can make the, uh, the request from the JavaScript, bring it back to Flash. Uh, Kaltura made a, a great open source project called Nginx VOD module that uh, um, changes MP4 progressive on the fly in the server side uh, to HLS and then if you uh, mix it with the flash, flash LS or something like MST with HLS um, then you can go to a uh, JS based delivery model uh, MSC to HLS is an interesting project. Uh, BGS is, is now focusing on that, that um, actually let you uh, do this without Flash. So you get HLS chunks and push in into, uh, into MSC. Um, we decided to go with an API that is very similar to XHR. Actually, it is compatible with XHR. So we can bake our API into that JS and other technologies that are uh, JavaScript based. Uh, so it's just the same API. You can check it out on GitHub. Uh, and to sum things up, we want to move from this model to something that is JS delivery based. Uh, and then uh, we, we can hook in and uh, do the delivery even in complex media uh, use cases. That's it. Thank you, Adam. So are there any questions? Something? Clear? Like me, you were very clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah. Yeah. Uh, so you mean why? Why? What are we trying how to? Can how can we help uh, an existing CDN? Yeah. yeah. yeah so. Well, so yeah. So I think. I think this slide probably answers that the most. So, CDNs are great, but they don't have infinite uh, capacity, uh, especially not in places where they are not based. They don't have uh, pops. Uh, so we even Akamai, the best CDN in the world, uh, failed uh, several times uh, in, in large live events or in places where uh, in Asia or Latin America where it doesn't have that many uh, ca capacity. Uh, and also it can be expensive. So some people today are not using CDNs. They won't use a CDN because it's too expensive. And they can use something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the challenges when, when you build this kind of uh, solution because uh, we're, we are uh, dependent on the sessions, the web sessions. So if you close the tab, uh, you, you're not sharing anymore. And that's why we designed the, the algorithm to be very sensitive to that. Uh, it works. Um, from the beginning, it, you're, you're becoming uh, effective. Uh, and what we're trying also to do is when you navigate from pages within the same domain or um, from different domains, we'll try to share as much as possible. Uh, at the same time, we try to, to keep the resources, uh, uh, the users safe and not trying to abuse uh, anyone. Uh, so it's uh, a difficult challenge, but in many countries, the, the bandwidth is symmetric now and the upload is has really increased recently. Yeah. Is it 
some people's taste for the bandwidth and stuff like that. I mean, you cannot <coughs> abuse their connection. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so uh, we limit the uh, amount of bandwidth that we that we take, and we try to not use our uh, upload uh, capabilities in uh, uh, mobile networks. So uh, we do uh, GeoIP detection, and if it's a mobile uh, ISP, we're disabling the upload links. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, how do you uh, decide whether the it is a server to serve the fence or a peer or several peers? Uh, so the question was, how, how do we decide if it's uh, a peer serving the content, the server, or both of them? Uh, so usually it's both of them. Uh, it depends on the use case. If it's uh, if it's video, for instance, usually it starts with server, because the latency at the beginning of the session is better to the server before we we do all the signaling and connecting to other users. Uh, so usually the first chunks are fetched from a server, and then we try to uh, uh, fill the buffer of the playback as fast as, pa as possible using both of them. Once we reach the, a safe uh, margin we can uh, use peer-to-peer -peer, uh, only. That's uh, there are other use cases where you do all the time both of them because we want to achieve uh, hi the highest uh, throughput. Uh, in the consuming uh, perspective? Yes. Um, so the question is basically how do we uh, integrate with the adaptive bitrate algorithm? We, we haven't done it yet, so it's something we're about to do now. Um, but our goal is to, because we add uh, throughput to the end user, our goal is to achieve higher bitrates using the peer-to-peer. So imagine that you have a, um, a capped uh, uh, connection to, to the CDN and you cannot get more than one megabit per second. Uh, it doesn't mean that with peers you cannot get to two megabits per second. And that's what we're trying to achieve now and aim for the higher bit rate. Cool. Ah, last one. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the browsers are not asking the users. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the API works in a way that it's uh, transparent. Uh, I can tell later on the reasons, but uh, so it's basically up to the content provider to decide how he uh, how how to communicate with the user about it. Um, it can be an opt-in mechanism that only if you approve, you're becoming part of it and you benefit from it as well. Uh, but it's up to the publisher to decide. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.